Okay, so our next session, we're going to have um, some data blitz talks, and then we're going to have a conversation starter um, about the future of research on depression. Let me say in advance, thank you so much to our presenters, Ted Boshane and Tom Alino, and all of our future data blitz presenters for, um, for agreeing to do our crazy kind of approach here of trying to present lots of data really, really quickly with just a minimum of slides. Um, I know this is a crazy format, but we want to really inspire discussion. Um, so thank you to them. Very um, unfortunate that Temi Moffat let us know overnight that she had a family member fall ill and she was tending to them overnight and is unable to come. So we won't be able to hear her data blitz, but um, she prepared it and might be able to record it um, for us anyway. And if so, I'll send it out to all of you to watch on YouTube. So. Um, but thank you very much. Without further ado, our first Data Blitz speaker is Ted Boshane. Uh, thank you, Mitch. I want to um, thank uh, you and Eric for the opportunity to uh, present here. Um, when I saw the crazy format that you mentioned, I thought, how hard could it be to uh, present three slides? And then I was reminded of uh, Mark Twain's wisdom when he said, I'd have written a shorter book if I'd had more time. Um, so I've shortened my title uh, to be commensurate with the presentation uh, format. So Structural and Functional Correlates of Adolescent Self-Harm. And I'm going to talk about what are really pilot data, um, a, a couple of uh, papers that came out of the same uh, study of adolescents who, um, adolescent girls who engage in self-harm. Um, and hoped to generate some discussion uh, around that. Um, before the, I, I, I jump into the two papers, though, I have to say a couple of things about our neurodevelopmental theory of non-suicidal self-injury, suicidal behaviors, and uh, in some cases, eventual borderline personality development um, to, to, to provide appropriate background. And the first paper that came out about this was back in 2009, 10 years ago in Psychological Bulletin, first authored by Sheila Kroll while she was a graduate student. Um, and at the time, we didn't have much data. There was a lot uh, in that paper that was conjectural. Uh, there are more data now uh, that have come out that are consistent with the model. Uh, most recently, um, uh, Steve Henshaw, me, and Jeff Bridge uh, wrote a paper that appeared in Clinical Psychological Science, if anyone's interested. So um, the crux of the theory is that non-suicidal self-injury and suicidal behaviors are most likely to develop when uh, highly heritable trait impulsivity uh, expressed as symptoms of hyperactive impulsive and combined presentations of ADHD interacts with uh, aversive environments, including phys physical abuse, sexual abuse, and those environments promote emotion dysregulation expressed as inability to dampen uh, strong negative affect. Um, and this is one pathway. We're certainly not proposing that we account for all um, non-suicidal self-injury and suicidal behavior. Um, and so some support for uh, this interaction hypothesis, uh, and there are other um, areas of support that I don't have time to present, comes from data on uh, population prevalence uh, of uh, suicide attempts and self-injury, uh, and then uh, prevalence rates in, among those who have been exposed to uh, maltreatment, those who have um, ADHD, and then the combination of those two factors. So if we look at the population prevalence of self-injury, it's troublingly at about 20%. Uh, so, so adolescent girls, um, in about one in five, engage in some form of self-injury. Um, most of them don't go on to develop more severe problems, but uh, that's troubling enough. Uh, if we look in maltreated samples of adolescent girls, we see uh, those rates rise to close to 30%. In ADHD uh, samples of adolescent girls, uh, about 30%. But if we look at girls who were diagnosed with uh, hyperactive impulsive and combined subtypes of ADHD uh, in childhood and who incurred maltreatment, uh, rates of self-injury rise to 50%. And of course, that's um, really troubling. If we look at suicide attempts, the population prevalence rate, of course, is low. Uh, among maltreated uh, adolescent girls, that rises to close to 10%. ADHD, also close to 10%. If we look at girls um, in late adolescence or women in young adulthood um, who were diagnosed with ADHD and incurred maltreatment, 
uh, we see uh, rates of suicide attempts that approach 35%. Mm -hmm. uh, to us, it's incumbent to, uh, to devise some sort of prevention uh, program that targets those goals specifically. Um, so that's some background, um, and now I want to describe a couple of um, neuroimaging studies. And again, these are uh, pilot data, um, and the first uh, study that I'll present was published a couple of years ago in Development and Psychopathology, where we examined neural responses to monetary incentives among self-injuring adolescent girls. And this follows from uh, the notion that impulsivity is uh, a contributing factor uh, to self-injury. And so um, we examined patterns of subcortical uh, and cortical responding to incentives among self-injuring girls, so 19, and a control sample of adolescent girls. The only screen outs we had here were bipolar disorder and autism spectrum disorder. So uh, this is a sample recruited for non-suicidal self-injury, not for any uh, psychiatric disorder. So they had to engage in uh, three or more moderately to highly lethal self-injury episodes in the past year or five or more lifetime. They were 13 to 17 years old and again recruited solely for self-harm. Uh, ADHD symptoms were elevated with a fairly uh, large effect size, um, which is um, interesting to note given the data that I presented uh, before. And here are striatal and orbital frontal regions of interest in which self-injuring girls exhibited less neural activation to reward cues than controls. And anyone who is familiar with the ADHD literature would say, hey, that looks like the neural signature, whatever that means, of uh, boys with ADHD while responding to Knudsen's uh, monetary incentive delay task. So um, that's the first study I want to present. Uh, the second is one where we examined in the same sample um, structural uh, correlates of self-harm, uh, particularly uh, in cortical regions. Uh, and this paper is in the current issue of, of development in psychopathology. Um, it's the same sample. We had one more uh, adolescent girl in both the self-injuring and control groups uh, who we didn't lose in the structural scans to uh, movement. Um, and we performed whole brain analyses to evaluate cortical correlates of emotion dysregulation that are observed in uh, adult women with borderline personality disorder. And here are some of those regions, the insular cortex, the inferior frontal gyrus, various portions of the prefrontal cortex and the lateral uh, orbital frontal cortex. Um, and what we found was smaller bilateral insula and inferior front, white inferior frontal gyrus volumes among the self-injurers. Um, here's a slide that um, shows where those uh, volumetric um, abnormalities, if you will, were found. Um, these brain regions are important uh, for self and emotion regulation functions among some other functions. Um, and findings parallel those from adult women with borderline personality disorder and adolescents on first presentation of borderline personality disorder, but they don't extend to as many cortical regions. And in the paper that um, I showed you, we explore some of the reasons why that might be. There are several possibilities. And um, to keep the presentation short as I'm supposed to, uh, that's all I got. So thank you.